All right, everybody. <laughs> We're doing great. Welcome to Co-Plow Round. Can I grab these slides from you? All right. Uh, Gillian's not here. We've got Kelsey Megan listed on the PowerPoint, but that's incorrect. It is Kelsey Megan and without Gillian. Uh, is tissue from a cat. This is Rascal. Rascal is an 11 year old domestic short hair cat. The clinician sent us the left eye. Um, what they told us was that there was corneal disease that was preventing them from evaluating intraocular structures. They suspected that there was either an intraocular tumor or inflammation. So what we have here is a globe, the cornea is up here, the optic nerve is down here. Um, this is the lens, or at least what used to be the lens. Um, and then the rest of the eye is kind of filled with all of this whitish material, um, which looks like it kind of has some structure to it. Um, it's not, not just complete like pus or exudate. Uh, there's some kind of architecture there. But uh, most of the normal structures that we would expect to see inside of the eye have been pretty much obliterated. So let us go to the slide. All right. Well, this is what we got to work with. Um, okay, so we've got cornea. I'm actually going to flip this around for you real quick so it'll match up later. Um, so we've got cornea here on the left. Uh, this is the cornea that they said they had difficulty uh, seeing through in order to figure out what exactly was happening inside the eye. Um, here is that fragmented lens that we were able to appreciate grossly. You can see that there's hemorrhage inside of the lens capsule. Lens capsule is discontinuous. Later on, I'm going to go down and prove to you that that's actually real and actually happening. Um, and then we've got all of this purple cellularity that's kind of coating the inside of the globe. So there's some here that's obliterating the ciliary body and the iris. And then it's following along kind of uh, the posterior aspect of the cornea. Same thing on the other side, obliterating the ciliary body and the iris. Um, it's kind of wrapping around the posterior of the lens. And then uh, it's also, whatever this cellularity is, is also involving the retina, which here is detached. And then we've got our optic nerve back here, which of all things inside of this eye actually doesn't look that bad. So let us go closer. All right. So here's our cornea. You can understand why it was difficult for the clinicians to see through this. It's really cellular. When we look at it more closely, there is also some vascularity. So we've got blood vessels. We've got a lot of neutrophils in here. There was probably some edema happening. So it's not surprising that the clinician couldn't see through this to figure out what was really happening inside of this eye. Um, but what we're interested in really is all of these cells, right? So let's go look at them because we all understand that that's the really relevant thing happening here. So supercellular, kind of disorganized. Um, there's not really any normal architecture here anymore. When, when we look at them at this magnification, it looks like kind of maybe there's some areas where they're kind of forming bundles, but then there's areas where they're just super disorganized sheets and there's no shape to them whatsoever. And if we look at these cells more closely, they kind of have a variable morphology. So we're going to have yeah, we'll a look at these guys. All right. So they've got really big nuclei with really prominent nuclei. It's difficult to see cell borders. Um, but some of these cells have multiple nuclei. There are some big nuclei and some small nuclei. Um, they're maybe spindle shaped, um, but the cell borders are hard to make out, so it's kind of hard to determine what shape they actually are. Some of them look kind of more round. There's also some really small cells in here that are probably non-neoplastic lymphocytes. Um, 
And then in other areas, the cells become sort of more convincingly round. So these guys here um, have that more round shape and they're just kind of forming clumps. Um, and then their neighbors, some of them are a little bit more spindeloid. So we've got this population of cells with a variable morphology that I think everybody is probably comfortable calling neoplasia at this point. Um, and then we'll go ahead and look at the lens capsule. This is the lens capsule that I told you was broken. It genuinely, honestly, is actually broken. Um, there are little cells nibbling away at the edge of this broken tip of the lens capsule. And then there are also some of these neoplastic cells inside of the lens capsule. Um, and as we track along, you can see they're pretty abundant, um, kind of carpeting the inside of the lens capsule. We keep going and then uh, they really become much thicker. And these ones are less round, more spindeloid or more fusiform. Um, and uh, yeah, they really, they extend basically along the entire inner aspect of the lens capsule. We also have some lens protein that's still present. The lens protein that is here is uh, being munched up by neutrophils. I do not know why that's green, um, <laughs> but the lens protein that is here is being up, munched up by neutrophils and some macrophages. Um, in other areas, it's liquefied. I don't know why this turned green nor do I know how to fix it. Say that again? It doesn't like reds. It doesn't like reds? Well, bummer, because <laughs> there's a lot of red in this eye. Yeah, if we go higher and it's a dark tumor, it goes down. Um, so like I said, there's hemorrhage, there's liquefaction of these lens proteins. And then we're going to go look at the retina, which is detached and is kind of interesting. Um, so here's our retina. And if we go closer to the optic nerve, it's a little bit more convincing as retina. You can kind of see the layers that used to exist, outer and inner. Um, but then as we track away from the optic nerve and closer towards kind of the anterior uvea, some of our neoplastic cells are present within the retina and they're kind of almost defacing the retina. They're also expanding vascular walls. So we've got neoplastic cells within the walls of these vessels. They're not inside the vessels per se, anywhere that I could tell. Although in places like this, it starts to make you a little bit nervous on the cat's behalf. And you wonder like, is there endothelium here anymore? This was definitely a vessel at one point, <laughs> but now it's just a bunch of neoplastic cells that have formed the shape of a vessel. Um, so those are all of the interesting things about this case. Um, and we diagnosed a feline ocular post-traumatic sarcoma. And we gave differentials of the spindle cell variant versus the round cell variant because of the sort of biphasic morphology of this and the invasion into the retina and then the sort of coating of the inner aspect of the uveal tract. Um, we weren't really confident that we could differentiate between the two. And we also speculated maybe there's both. So the spindle cell variant um, arises from the actual lens epithelium when there's damage to the lens. Um, the lens epithelium undergoes malignant transformation. Um, and then that's where this post-traumatic sarcoma comes from in the eye of a cat. Um, the round cell variant, we think, arises more from um, inflammatory cells that come in in response to lens damage and then undergo malignant transformation. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility that both of these processes happened. It's not something that we see very often. I think we did say we had two cases in the database that we had diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we didn't say how many. We have diagnosed it in the past. I don't know how often. Um, Leandra says very rare. I think I think the microphone can get you. Um, and then... Obviously, we diagnosed the keratitis, um, the hypercataract with the lens capsule rupture and the phacitis, the retinal detachment, and then um, clinically, they diagnosed glaucoma. It was difficult for us to assess glaucoma, given that the retina was mostly obliterated and the optic nerve head was so distorted by the detachment. But uh, given that there's also no iridocorneal angle anymore, it uh, almost seemed like a reasonable progression of the uh, symptoms that this cat had. Uh, good news for the cat. It looked like the margins were clean. Um, so at least they got it all. It's not clear whether or not 
how it managed to get into blood vessels. Um, so hopefully they give us follow-up. We did ask uh, if they would be interested in running immunohistochemistry because uh, we would really like to know if these are lymphocytes or spindle cells or both, uh, but so far they have not agreed to that. Yeah, to clarify the the round cell would be a, a lymphoma. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, the round cell variant is a lymphoma, thanks. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, all right, our next case. We are going to have a whole slew of exotics today um, because uh, Megan got a whole bunch of exotics and we're like, well, why not? We'll find that I had to. This is a ferruginous hawk. Let me get the paperwork. This is, they think it was about 21 years old. They, they think it was an intact female. Obviously, it's difficult to tell with birds unless you're actually doing a necropsy. Uh, but this is a ferruginous hawk. They think it's about 21 years old. They sent us the left globe. Uh, what they described was an irritable mass that's taking up about 90% of the anterior chamber. They could tell that it was attached to the iris based on ultrasound, and they also saw some cataracts. Um, for the duration, they listed it as two years. Um, so they have this is present for a while, and I've just been monitoring it, and eventually it got too big. Um, so this isn't tricky. <laughs> What I described is actually there. So here is cornea. Here is lens. Um, here is the ear glass, which indeed is taking up about 90% of the anterior chamber. They were, were so right. Um, <laughs> we had some retinal detachment or maybe choroidal detachment. We couldn't tell. Um, and then kind of there was this weird spot of depigmentation in the cornea that I was all excited about when I was trimming. And then on his, it looks like, like literally nothing. Um, with some kind of tearing artifact of processing, which was devastating for me because I was really excited for it to mean something. <laughs> um, optic nerve is here. And then here we've pectin uh, or pectin oculi, I think, um, it, which is a normal structure in the globe. And it looks normal, grossly and histologically. Uh, so let's go to the slide. All right. Um, there's not a ton to say on subgross that we didn't already say on roast itself, but uh, cornea, here's that enormous mass. It's really, I do want you to appreciate the pattern of this mass on subgross because it's actually really pretty. It's got this kind of swirly, whirly duration with all of these streams of cells that are dissected by this collagen matrix. Um, and then just posterior to that, we've got the lens. Ooh, it's really, really hard for this not to tip over. Okay. Uh, we've got the lens. There's a lot of liquefaction of lens fibers. We've lost a lot of lens architecture. And it's not completely sampled, unfortunately. Um, un and also, unfortunately, the site we have, we can't really tell where this is arising. We have one normal iris leaflet here. Um, and then we've got like a tip of iris leaflet here, but the actual treatment is uh, um, things due to artifact. But uh, we were able to tell grossly that it was definitely arising from the iris. Um, so let's look at this a little more closely. All right, here's our mass, which apparently is going to cause the microscope to become very unhappy and make different colors again. But it is very heavily pigmented, as you can see. It's making these beautiful swirling patterns. If we go closer, we can see Ooh. Um, and the fogginess, I'm sorry, but it's a, a large slide. And so the kind of uh, op ocular, the optical densities mm -hmm. and refraction <laughs> and other microscope words are uh, not perfect on large slides. So they turn out blurry sometimes. Um, so I'm actually, uh, we'll see. I, yeah, it's not going to like 40x at all. All right, we are staying at 20x. Um, but you can see these really heavily pigmented cells that are very spindle shaped and they kind of form these swirls and packets and cords and they've got yeah, are fairly uniform kind of round to oval, um, not nearly as dramatic as the morphology that we're seeing in our uh, previous case with cat. 
in places where it's a little bit less heavy-mented, um, you can kind of see more easily the nuclear morphology. I really wish I could go closer, but it's just not going to happen. Um, and we described mm, zero mitotic figures. We did not see any mitotic figures. Um, mm -hmm. Just before we leave this slide, because that's really all there is to say about this. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the lens. The lens has been pressed up against this tumor for two years, according to history, as the tumor is slowly in it, and the lens does not enjoy that experience at all. And so over time, it has developed a cataract. Uh, this is all lens epithelium that is proliferating and undergoing fibrous metaplasia. There's a lot of liquefaction of lens fibers here, like we were able to uh, uh, identify on subgross. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's mineralization. There's a lot of little crumblies in here of mineral. Um, so the cataract that they diagnosed on ultrasound was also present. Can we jump to the posterior lens gap pretty quick? Um, I don't know if we have it. Oh, we can okay. try. Uh, it's curious. it's really poorly sampled. Uh -huh. um, yeah, we have it. So the interior lens caps look so thin that I wondered if there was like a... Um, it does look super thin. And then turn around. Yeah, it is really thin, but this is kind of, yeah. All right. This wasn't a complicated one. It was just going yeah. along with our theme uh, exotics. Um, so yeah, we diagnosed an anterior uveal melanocytoma, just the same as in a dog, just presumably way less common. Um, they are very infrequently reported in birds. I think I found one in a chicken and maybe one and a budgie and a couple of other birds, um, but they're not common. Uh, the ones that I saw reported in birds were more often malignant and had metastases. This one we call benign based on the uh, lack of mitotic figures and the nice contained behavior. Um, and then we diagnosed cataract. So it's uh, just like a dog. Here's your comparative anatomy for the day. It, they're all the same. All the animals are the same. <laughs> um, okay, I am gonna swap out with Megan. Work that it's not gross. The ones that we want to use. Um, all right. So this is a dark eyed junko. Uh, um, this is a wild bird. Um, it was, uh, um, observed to strike a window, um, and they res responded initially well to treatment for head trauma, but developed ocular anomalies, um, and basically they were going to release the bird, but uh, the eye was too badly affected, and the bird was unreleasable. Um, so uh, what they sent us was uh, the whole uh, formalin-fixed head um, with the skin and muscle removed, as you can probably see. Um, <clears throat> The head is a little bit turned, uh, the sort of beak down on this photo of the right eye, so that kind of accounts for some of the irregularities, but you can kind of see here comparing the left eye, which was uh, normal to the right eye, um, that there's a little bit of a kind of yellowish cast through the pupil here, um, which uh, maybe a little bit of more opacity uh, if you kind of put it on your imaginoscope, but um, the right eye was the one that was sort of clinically affected. Um, and sure enough, when we uh, sectioned, um, so in, in essence, this uh, whole head was decalcified. Um, we made a section right down the sagittal midline and then um, sectioned along the optic nerves. So the, the, the um, plane of section is kind of nearly horizontal, probably a little oblique through the globe kind of on this level. So uh, we have the brain kind of sectioned in like flat section, uh, sort of semi-horizontal section here. We've got the optic nerve coming up into the globe. We've got the pectin, which you can just make out floating in this like sea of um, purulent looking goo. Um, so the whole eye was full of inflammatory exudates and uh, sort of accounts for um, concerns about the eye clinically uh, and the reason why this bird could not be released. Um, so that's the, the gross and we'll switch to histo. 
And I want to start with the normal globe uh, first, just because um, I think it'll make a nice comparison. Let's make it a little bit less dewy. There we go. Um, so again, we have this nice section with the uh, optic nerve going all the way back into the brain. Here's the eye itself. There's still kind of some goo. Hang on one second. It's going to be distracting otherwise. There we go. Um, we've got the cornea up here. We've got the lens, which is a little bit awkwardly sampled. Um, we've got these um, delicate uh, pectinate ligaments through here and a very thin, delicate iris. Um, we've got a third eyelid coming in here, which is kind of cute. It's got this sort of windshield wiper uh, look, uh, as what Leandro was saying earlier. Isn't that cool? And um, the retina is a little bit folded, but we have a nice, lovely, normal looking retina. This is the pectin, um, or what we kind of capture of it. You can kind of see how richly vascular that is. You can see all those little blood vessels and the nucleated erythrocytes of the bird in that pectin and the nice normal optic nerve. So all of that kind of sticks in your mind and compare to the right globe. Which is a little different. Um, so indeed, the entire globe is filled with uh, fibrin, proteinaceous fluid, necrotic debris. And even from low magnification, you can already make out these kind of uh, multifocal clusters of basophilic stuff. And uh, looking closer at those, they are all bacteria, tons and tons and tons of bacteria. Ooh, we're not going to use that objective. Uh, so <laughs> this is about as close as we're going to get. Um, maybe take my word for it that these bacteria are um, cocci, um, sometimes 60, arranged in... 60, go beyond the 40. Yeah, the 40 just seems like, oh, the 60 is even worse. Yeah, this shouldn't be like that. You can kind of see okay. here. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, anyway, they're cocci, trust me. Uh, sometimes forming chains. Um, a pretty um, sort of monotypic population of bacteria, sort of one morphology of bacteria throughout. It's not very mixed, which kind of comes into play in a hot second. Um, but there's tons of them. Um, they're definitely, as if you even needed to confirm it, uh, inside macrophages on occasion, um, kind of being phagocytized. Um, so definitely in vivo bacteria. Um, and so... This is a pretty severe septic endophthalmitis. Um, briefly, I'll show you. So you can make it out just barely the layers of the retina here. Same layers as before, but all of these cells are sort of pycnotic. And we're sort of starting to lose the detail and the structure of the retina here. So this retina is just totally necrotic. And there's all of this subretinal inflammatory exudates full of bacteria again. And in the uveal stroma, we can see a nice inflammatory response as well. Um, tons of lymphocytes and some nice, lovely pink heterophils. Um, so there is a really severe septic endophthalmitis in this case. Um, briefly, just kind of for, for fun too, we have this lovely, delicate little uh, scleral cartilage here, which is part of a bird eye. And you can see the scleral oscle too. So I didn't show you on the normal ones. Um, it's decalcified bone, so it's pink. Um, and this bird also had some lymphocytic in inflammation around the globe, which was just sort of reactive. But um, you can note that although the inside of the eye is really badly affected, um, the pectin is even necrotic through here, um, the surrounding tissue, apart from a little bit of a lymphocytic reaction is okay. Um, there's nothing going on in the brain. The brain looks nice. No meningitis or anything tracking along the optic nerve. Um, so uh, in this case, the question kind of becomes, where did the bacteria come from uh, to get to this right eye? Um, and I think some things that you can think of is um, maybe particularly on the optic nerve local extension, which in this case is kind of ruled out right away um, because of completely and totally normal tissues surrounding the eye. 
Um, and so we're kind of left with either hematogenous spread, um, so to ride by the blood, or um, direct inoculation into the eye via contaminated penetrating trauma, which this bird did have a history of trauma, um, but we didn't see any histologic evidence of um, a site of penetration. So um, most likely hematogenous spread. A little unusual that this bird wasn't um, sort of overtly septicemic, that there wasn't anything wrong with the other eye, it's just this one eye. Um, we did a little bit of speculating that maybe some sort of damage caused by the window strike kind of predisposed this eye to serving as like an end point for these bacteria to proliferate in. Um, but it's kind of ultimately um, a bit unknown why this eye became so severely affected and we didn't see anything in the other one. Um, but uh, kind of a case and a chance to see a, a less sort of typical eye um, on service uh, in terms of species. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, so, and there you go. Uh, so that's it for the jungle. There aren't any else to say. We'll keep going. Um, so the next kind of fun species uh, is a banded rock rattlesnake. Um, so this banded, banded rock rattlesnake um, was basically just described as a very elderly patient. And that's it. That's pretty much the history that we got. Um, there wasn't anything specific as to why the snake was uh, euthanized. Um, and we received just the formal and fixed head of the snake, as you can see. Um, on gross, there isn't really much to point out the cloudiness of the surface of the eye as a post-fixation artifact. Um, we do have um, so this should be the nostril, and this should be the pit organ, uh, the pit organ again down here. Um, in terms of special senses, at least, that's uh, kind of cool to point out, the pit organ, um, which is part of the special senses of the snake. Um, and uh, the cut surface is um, pretty much not much to point out grossly either. Um, we have this nice, lovely lens visible here, sort of artifactual retinal attachment. Here's the little brain. Everything in snakes is kind of long like they are, so sort of a long thin brain. Um, sort of all on the gross. Um, we'll go to the histo. Um, so in this case, we just sort of uh, decalcified and then serially sectioned the head of the snake. Um, and I pulled this one uh, to, to show just because I thought the, the whole picture of the case was cool and we don't often get this type of uh, sample. Um, so we'll just kind of went all over some things. The actual actual eye part of this is probably going to be relatively brief. Um, but of course, we'll go to the eyes first because we're here in Koplau. So here's one eye. Here's the other one. Um, and an interesting thing about the snake is we have the spectacle captured here. It's this sort of modified skin that covers the surface of the eye. And then here's the actual cornea down in here. And then between the cornea and the spectacle, there's the subspectacular space. And if you get inflammation of the spectacle, you could call spectaculitis, which is one of my favorite diagnoses, um, which was not happening in this case. Uh, the eye was totally okay. Um, another interesting part of the snake is we saw that nice scleral cartilage and scleral oscle of the bird. Um, snakes just have a fibrous sclera, um, just like a dog or a cat would. Um, no cartilage or bone there um, for this guy. There's a nice lovely gland back here, maybe Hardarian gland, all this nice lovely pink gland. Um, there's, that's kind of it. There's not much I can show you about the eye. <laughs> it was actually doing pretty good. Um, but some other fun things to show you on this head. Um, snakes kind of continually grow their teeth. And I wanted to show uh, how cool that is. We kind of have some teeth here at various stages of development from sort of less to more mature. There's actually another area back here somewhere that was really cool for that. Uh, let's see, I like this section up here. Look at that, all those okay. teeth right in a row and you can kind of track them from sort of earlier in development to later in development with more dentin. That's pretty neat. Um, while we're here though, one of the important things to show about this snake that's actually significant to the diagnostics in the snake is right here. So this is inside the mouth. We're basically on, at the roof of the mouth. You can see the teeth right next door. And you can see the more normal oral mucosal epithelium here. And then suddenly that epithelium kind of peters out and is replaced by this crust with uh, some heterophils infiltrating the tissue immediately underneath. 
um, and some heterophils, which are lovely and pink, sort of percolating out. They're infiltrating around the tooth. There's sort of multifocal ulceration as well in some other areas. Um, so this snake had a pretty significant ulcerative and heterophilic stomatitis. Um, probably not too surprising. It's a pretty common uh, thing that can afflict snakes. It's actually quite a large ulcer over here again. So just showing that off. Here's the skin of the snake with a little scale captured here. And they were kind of coming right around sort of the lip into the oral mucosa. And we've got this great big ulceration right there. Um, so uh, stomatitis in the snake. Um, some other cool things to show. Kind of back to where we were with the eyes, actually. These big dilated spaces here um, are venom ducts. And they're full, uh, full of proteinaceous fluid, but also this sort of crystalline debris. Um, and there's a little bit of heterophilic infiltration along the edges of this duct, which maybe will be picked up on by the camera here. Very, very mild. Um, so when with a stomatitis in a snake, sometimes um, some ducts of glands can actually get sort of obstructed. Um, this can actually be part of what causes fluid to accumulate in a subspectacular space in some cases. Um, if the nasolacrimal duct is obstructed. Um, so we kind of speculated that there may have been some obstruction of the venom duct. Hard to be sure, but part of the reason why is that the venom gland back here in the head of the snake, we'll show you the other side too, uh, eventually, there we go. So we have these glandular acini, and then part of the gland is kind of replaced by inflammation, and we've got some heterophils, we've got some macrophages, Um, so there's some, some degree of sort of degener degeneration and inflammation in the gland. Um, so some speculation as to what may have caused it or the significance of it, but uh, ultimately just kind of a gee whiz thing. Um, and also this is what the venom gland of a snake looks like. Uh, another cool trick, if we can get the camera to um, be nice to us here, which I probably should have found the filter earlier. Here we go. <clears throat> may or may not work on camera. We'll have to see. Nope, they got to, yep, there we go. We have to rotate the one in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh -huh. All right. Maybe not. Yeah, it's not Sometimes the camera doesn't pick up polarization very well for us, unfortunately. Uh, maybe, it, oh, no, not on the camera. It picks up a little on the scope, but not on the camera, unfortunately. Um, you'll have to take my word for it that uh, some of that crystalline debris in the duct and the gland was um, birefringent and was a very, very pretty. And I would have liked to show you just for the wow factor as well, but uh, not today, apparently. Um, so that's kind of it. Just some cool things to show around the head of the snake. Um, and uh, some uh, brief anatomic features in the eye. Um, all right, uh, I think that's all I wanted to show you. Um, so here's some diagnoses, uh, and with that, we'll move on. Okay, Leandro here now. Next case, we have a cat moving away from the special species. Let's see what was the one. Five. All right, this is Sebastian. Sebastian is a one year, eight month old domestic short haired cat, male domestic short haired cat. They described chronic panuviitis in a weak a, uh, FIP positive titer with mildly elevated globulins. So that's all we got. And um, they did not describe glaucoma. All right. So this is what we received. So the first thing on a gross appearance or the most uh, striking thing 
is this very dense uh, whitish yellow exudate in the vitreous. Um, and of course, we don't have a chance to poke this, but if you did poke this when we were cutting, you see this is basically solid. It's a gel-like structure. So this is a high protein uh, exudate. Uh, you can see some of that also in the anterior chamber. You got the iris, the ciliary body, the lens, and uh, the optic nerve is a little bit deeper, but it can follow up the detached retina kind of floating in the middle of that gel-like exudate. So this is one, um, this is an important feature that we like to address for cases like this, is the gross appearance of the exudate. Okay, so subgross. Let's put that so gross looks like, so all that exudative material that we saw grossly looks, well, let me do something pretty quick here because I think that is the reason why we're not getting. We're not able to use the 40X. Yeah, I think the problem is that people adjust it for looking through the scope and looking right. through the scope is not the same as the exactly. screen. Okay, oh, here it is. So all that dense uh, exudate that we saw grossly looks um, densely eosinophilic here on histology. And you can see it. There's not a lot. Of, it's uh, it's mostly acellular. So it's a protein rich dense, but um, mostly acellular exudate. You see inflammatory cells kind of at the periphery, but mostly at the center is acellular and also a similar uh, material in the anterior chamber. Um, also, right away, you can see that the iris, the ciliary body, and the less so, but also the choroid are infiltrated by well, a highly cellular component. We'll take a look at that later. Here is the, the detached retina in the center. It's also hypercellular. And also the optic nerve is somewhat hypercellular. Here's the lens just hanging out there. So a little closer. Starting with the front of the eye, there's a little bit of vascularization of the corneal stroma that cell rich exudate, or the cell poor exudate or protein rich exudate, sorry, that we talked about. In the anterior chamber, it has, so I'm going to play a game that we call 50 Shades of Pink, which is um, to the right here, you can see how more homogeneous everything is. So it's a protein uh, 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 rich kind of exudation. To the left, you start seeing a little bit more fibrin. This is what fibrin looks like. All right, let's keep adjusting. Yeah, that's what fibrin looks like. And there are some free floating neutrophils, macrophages, and here and there some lymphocytes and plasma cells, and some red blood cells. And a similar type of exudate in the, here in the subretinal space, right? Because we have complete retinal detachment. And this is basically what's left of the vitreous right there in the middle. Attach the retina and the subretinal space. Now, the most important thing, let's take a look at the uveal infiltrate. So, the iris, ciliary body, and choroid are infiltrated by Yeah, this is kind of annoying. So I'm I'm just trying to focus things here or get a better lighting. Um a yeah, does not like the higher magnification. Okay. The it's infiltrated by large numbers of plasma cells, 
So I know you guys can't, see, well, you might not be able to see a little higher, but uh, gotta trust that there's a lot, a lot of plasma cells here. So we call this a um, plasma cell rich lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Um, and the reason I'm pointing that out is again, it comes back to the diagnosis. And also here and there, the infiltrate changes from lymphoplasmacytic to somewhat histocytic. So these are macrophages or histocytes that are also in the stroma with you know, neutrophils here and there. We are at the irritable coronal angle, so they might be trickling down from the interior chamber. But this inflammatory component, it's somewhat uh, repetitive throughout. Here's a little closer where you can see lymphocytes, plasma cells with scattered macrophages. Um, in the iris and ciliary body epithelium, we get more macrophages and sort of free-floating, more uh, foamy macrophages with fewer neutrophils and some lymphocytes and plasma cells. So we didn't start this. Uh, well, let me do this before we move on. Um, and then in the choroid, some areas of necrosis of the epithelium, and again, a similar component here. Now it is giving up on us. All right, there you go. Here it, it's back. With lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages, the fewer neutrophils. Uh, and the choroid is kind of similar. You can see some um, hypertrophied and hyperplastic RPE cells and inflammatory cells kind of in between. So putting this all together, as I, as I was saying, well, we're not done yet. Got a retina. Keep wanting to wrap it up, but I keep forgetting this. Okay, here's a choroid, a little more, a little denser in terms of macrophages, I don't know, no, the histocytic component and some hypertrophy RPE cells. And we get closer to the optic nerve, marked gliosis and atrophy of the optic nerve. They didn't mention glaucoma, but I bet this cat was glaucomatous. Uh, you can see how extensively effaced the optic nerve head is, and extending from it, the retina, markedly detached, and also markedly infiltrated by the same inflammatory cells. So putting this all together with the history, so um, it is a one-year, eight-month-old cat. It has a positive titer for FAP, even if they said weak. Um, everything else histologically really fits with FAP. So the things that we look for are the presence of the dense um, proteinaceous exudates that we see both grossly and histologically, the presence of a plasma cell rich lymphoplasmacytic inflammation in the iris ciliary body and, or in the whole uvea with a, a good component of macrophages associated to it. Sometimes if you look around, uh, some of these macrophages can look downright scary, uh, but they're 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 mostly reactive, you know, uh, uh, foamy to epithelioid macrophages, um, and you know there's a little bit of a, a neutrophilic component that really is variable. Uh, we offer uh, immunohistochemistry for FAP. Uh, I IHC is the gold standard. Um, the only caveat is that a positive result on IHC confirms FAP, but a negative result does not rule it out. Uh, and there, um, there was a paper published, uh, I was going to say recently, but my brain has been a little mushy in terms of uh, time after COVID. So it could be two years, it could be 10 years. Uh, but this paper was published showing uh, that in cats, in, in, in the eye of cats of, with FAP, most of the positivity that they get in IHC is from the free-floating macrophages like these guys that we're seeing here, um, which uh, the authors then suggested that a lot of those positive macrophages likely came from um, the systemic circulation rather than you know, having a local deposit of um, uh, uh, positivity for, for the virus. So for the pathologists out there, if you got an IHC for uh, um, uh, FIP in the eye, 
the highest chance for you to find positivity is in these macrophages. And it's uh it's it's kind of underwhelming generally. Uh, rarely we get very striking positivity. So pay attention to those cells. You might have a better chance of finding. So yep. Mark lymphoplasmosiditis, jocidic, neutrophilic, penivitis, retinitis, optic neuritis, with marked fibrinosuppurative, endophthalmitis, and protein rich intracular exudate consistent with feline infectious peritonitis. Give it one, give it two, give it two. So, this is our final diagnosis. So, fits both the age, clinical presentation, and the histologic features. Okay, next one is another cat, Lily. Lily is a 10-year-old female spade domestic short-haired cat um, with a history of uh, loss of vision and a ventral arrow mass effect from a suspected scleral eruption of, the, of a uveal tumor and a ventral lateral corneal vascular mass slash infiltrate. And you can see it here exactly what the clinicians are talking about. There is a very beautiful drawing here, which unfortunately you guys can't see. They also said that the cat had no glaucoma uh, and had some corneal fibrosis and vascularization. So as they described, here's what we have. You can follow here. Here's the limbus. Right, and you can see that the limbus is effaced on this side, and there's this white uh, uh, mass lesion that's infiltrating and partially effacing uh, the well, and effacing the uh, limbo and equatorial sclera. This mass ex also extends into the uh, uh, ciliary body and iris, and extends into the anterior chamber somewhat. You can see some of the iris here, so more like into the anterior chamber and the ciliary body, and a little bit here deeper on the city, but, but the rest looks fine. Um, maybe some opacities here in the lens, some hemorrhage associated with it, but most of the business relates to the, the mass effect there. So this is what the subgrowth looks like. Again, cornea mirroring perfectly the gross image. The only uh, we can see better here is uh, where the limbus should have been, end of the asymptote brain kind of right there. It's mass effective facing the sclera. Now you can appreciate some of the pars placata of the ciliary body and the pars plana and how that infiltrative faces everything there. A little bit of sclera left. And you can see the iris and then a uh, uh, cellular infiltrate into the interior chamber. So let's take a closer look to it. Okay. Let me go the other way. So we can have a better idea where we are. So here are the limbus, cornea, going towards that mass. You see there's marked corneal edema and the stroma is being placed by this infiltrate. Pretty quick, let me clean it. And right away on a lower magnification, there's this pattern. Of, well, there, there's some uh, liquefied most cavitated areas and this multi-nodular pattern of this infiltrate with some more solid areas in between, right? Um, you can see these cavitated necrotic kind of liquefied areas. Go a little deeper. It's a similar morphology going into the anterior chamber. Here's the end of the membrane, right? So for now, we're still debating what this is, if this is neoplastic or infectious. But just want to give you guys a, an overall view of what's going on here. Very homogeneous, 
throughout. So let's go back to that area where we started. Coming a little closer. Now, we can see a heterogeneous population of cells. Uh, and the heterogeneity goes beyond just uh, cellular type, but uh, maybe cellular species, let's say. Here, you guys can see neutrophils throughout, and lots of foamy to epithelioid macrophages, and some interesting looking things in there. So again, macrophages, neutrophils, and the culprits. Right there, we have two organisms, two yeasts, uh, size-wise and uh, capsule-wise and morphology-wise, look like blastomyces. So it's very rewarding when we find an organism like that because oh, here they are. Blastomyces, blastomyces, blastomyces. Because uh, then you have your diagnosis. So the whole mass was caused by an ocular blastomycosis uh, here. So a pyogranulomatous uh, scleritis, uh, keratitis, endophthalmitis, and pan and well, say anterior uveitis. So lots and lots of organisms throughout. So it was described as a mass. It is a mass. It's an, you know, a, a granulomatous mass. Um, the way the clinicians describe, I think most people would uh, imagine this was going to be something neoplastic, but it turns out to be something infectious. So... And you can see the, the extension of it. The rest of the eye was relatively spared. Go back towards the, the retina and the optic nerve. Looks good, right? But then uh, blastomycosis is usually associated with systemic disease. In cats, more specifically, um, one of the problems we have in cats is that blastomycosis could be associated with a central nervous system disease. They like to spread to the brain. Um, and, uh, when you, when you see them in the eye, there's no, no, uh, let's see here. Uh, all right. There's an interesting uh, history that I forgot. So rescued two to three years ago with an amputated front leg due to unknown reasons, no other medical history, blood work was within normal limits. The amputated front leg is interesting. It could be just a red herring. It could be kind of a, you know, Blasto-related osteomyelitis uh, that you know uh, became systemic, or uh, but it could be something unrelated. But no other medical history and blood work within normal limits. So we we aren't sure if this is systemic right now, or uh, uh, if the cat had a systemic blastomycosis and now we're seeing the effects of it in the eye. But whenever that happens in cats, one of the things that we suggest is to keep an eye out for uh, any brain disease or central nervous system disease. Another interesting thing is that this cat uh, is from Orlando, Florida, right? That is also the question. Was adopted, did it came from somewhere else? Uh, nothing said. You can't have blastomycosis in Florida, but it's rare. It's mostly in the Midwest. So I wonder if this cat was a, uh, you know, a transplant from the Midwest. At, uh, or I always like to joke, probably some uh, retiree that adopted a cat in the Midwest and then decided to retire and move to Florida and took the cat with it uh, with them. So we don't know. But last time I closed this in a cat. Here's our final diagnosis. Right, we have two minutes. I don't have. I don't think we have enough time to show the next one. So we're gonna leave it at that. We can show it next time. Yeah, we'll bring that over next time. It would have been a good uh, segue, but we don't have time to show it anyway. So have a, a good day, everyone. Whatever you are. Good afternoon. Good morning.
Uh, but in general, good day, and I'll see you guys in two weeks.